it's not so much about the elections per se that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the, the future of Malaysian politics and the future of UMNO. And I think most of us would agree that the future of UMNO will see Dato Saifuddin Abdullah playing a major role. And that is one of the main reasons why we invited him to, to, to pick his brains, as it were, to let him talk about his ideas about what is happening in Malaysia, not only where BN and UMNO are concerned, but also about the, the opposition and, and the relations between the two divides, as it were, two sides. Um, now, Dato Saifuddin Abdullah is a member of the UMNO Supreme Council, so his campaigning is not over yet. There will be a big one coming up soon. Uh, but he is also known for being involved in the Youth Academy and in issues about youth, about the young, and about the future, of course, of, of Malaysian politics. And he's published quite a few books, five at least, I think. And uh, he is a, a regular columnist as well in the Malay Mail and Sina Harian. Sina Harian is nowadays usually considered as the paper worth reading. <laughs> Uh, in Malaysia. Um, and prior to active politics, he was president of Malaysian Youth Council, a member of the United Nations Secretary General's High Level Panel on Youth Employment. And he's also a businessman, university administrator, teacher, editor, father, you know, loads more. An active person, definitely, but uh, always concerned with youth issues. Um, and today's talk will be about democratic hope, of course, also about youth again, I would think. So uh, let, let's welcome Datu Saifuddin to, to speak. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Oi, uh, Ambassador Tan Chin Tiong, brothers and sisters, First and foremost, I would like to thank ISIS for inviting someone who recently lost in the general election. <laughs> so you have before you someone who is in between job. And I would like to consider this. First of all, this is an honor to be here. This is my fourth visit here, uh, my second time speaking here. But, you know. Uh, I always tell people nowadays when I'm invited to give speeches and for sharing, I take it like in a jazz. This is like an interview for a new job. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, um, we are just about a month after uh, the recent GE13 in Malaysia. I'm sure you have been looking at many of the analysts um, Chinese tsunami, uh, urban tsunami, uh, Malaysian tsunami, and all kinds of tsunami. Uh, when someone mentioned the Chinese tsunami, my first reaction was, yeah, if there was a Chinese tsunami, there was also Malaysian, uh, sorry, there was also uh, a Malay flash flood uh, together with the Chinese tsunami. But my take of the GE13 was, slightly, uh, not totally different, but I, I look at it from a different uh, perspective. First of all, I think uh, the GE13 was generational in nature for at least two reasons. Number one, uh, not that this is the first time you have big numbers of young voters coming out to vote, but this time, the number of young voters was the biggest uh, in the history of Malaysian general election. Secondly, um, if you look at the coming parliament or the present parliament, you will see very clearly the emerging uh, second echelon from both sides of the house. Uh, in BN side, you will see figures like Kari Jamaluddin, Raman Dalan, Kamala Naden, uh, Kari as a minister, Ahmad, uh, sorry, Raman Dalan from Sabah as a minister, both are from AMNO. 
Kamla Naden from MIC uh, as Deputy Minister. If MCA is in the cabinet, then you will be looking at people like Vikas Young, I, I assume. And unfortunately, you don't see Gan Peng Siu, uh, because Gan Peng Siu, uh, an MCA vice president, was not selected to contest Kluang, to defend Kluang, or to contest in Kluang. He's the Kluang uh, MCA chief. Uh, Kluang fell to, uh, was won by uh, Liu Chintong, Liu Chintong from the AP, former MP of uh, Bukit Bandera. But on the other side of the house, you will see uh, names like Norul Iza, Rafizi Ramli. And for PKR, uh, you have Nick Nazmi, now the Deputy Speaker of Selangor. Uh, Nick Nazmi is slightly younger, maybe one year younger than Rafizi. These are upcoming people in, the, in the PKR and in the AP, you will see, uh, of course, uh, Chin Tong, uh, Tony Puan. A newcomer will be Dr. Ong Kameng and Zaryo. Um, uh, in past, you probably see, of course, uh, my worthy opponent in Temulu, uh, Ustaz Nasruddin uh, Tantawi. But uh, perhaps uh, if you were to take more center stage. I'm, I'm talking about uh, people who were, talk, who were in the center stage in the whole planning of GE13 for the opposition members. Yeah? Uh, unfortunately for PAIS, I think they lost uh, Dr. Zul, who was very much, and Salahuddin Ayub, uh, who were very much in the, like their think tank uh, in the uh, GE13. So it is generational in that sense. Secondly, and I think this is even more important, it is transitional. And let me use two circles to, uh, as, as an analogy to illustrate what I mean by transitional. Prior to general election 1999, uh, and I'm using uh, Lee Meng's uh, uh, words to explain this, yeah. There was only one clear circle uh, in as far as uh, the electorate's perception or expectation to the GE. Uh, if you want to consider, if you want to use the, ter the term hopes, there was only one kind of hope. So one circle. I call that hope developmental hope. The issues will be infrastructure, welfare, do you have enough schools, enough masjid, enough uh, you know, roads, uh, do you have water supply, electricity. So this, these are basic, these are what I term as developmental hopes. And BN is extremely good at addressing uh, this kind of issues. But beginning 1999, I'm not saying that there were no opposition. There were already opposition, especially in 1969, strong opposition. But I'm looking at whether there was a cluster of hopes among people who opposed Perikatan and now Barisan. Yeah. There were oppositions, but you know, it's like you know, uh, the issues were scattered. You, you don't really see a trend. You don't, you don't really see a, a, a cluster, so you don't really see a circle. So a small circle, a new, a second circle start cropping up in 1999 election. And this new circle, I call it the democratic circle or the democratic hope. The issues in 1999 was chronism, corruption, and nepotism. That is something that we all know. Uh, but this circle grew bigger in every GE. 2004, they were there, but because the charm of Tun Abdullah Badawi was so great that people don't seem to see that this, this circle was there and growing bigger. People realize that the circle is even much bigger in 2008. This time, 
my take is the two circles are of equal size. Perhaps that's how we can explain why is it that BN on the one hand won or win the parliament with 60% of the seats but lost the popular vote. Yeah, we only garner 47% uh, of the popular vote. What makes this second circle? What makes the, uh, the new kind of hopes or aspiration? What is the rising tide uh, of the democratic hope? What are the issues? The issues are uh, democratic issues. For instance, integrity, corruption, I was in Malacca last Friday <coughs> sharing with the Malacca Chinese Assembly Hall and someone from the audience during the Q&A asked me a question. He said, Dean, uh, how would the BN now address the four C's? So I said, what are the four C's? Said, Corruption, cronyism, crime rate, cost of living. I said, thank you for not mentioning another two C's. Then it was his time to ask me, what are the other two C's? Cows and condominiums. <laughs> so issues on transparency, accountability. These are new issues. Uh, human rights, freedom. In the first circle, you talk about university education. In the second circle, people are talking about quality university education. In the first circle, you talk about access to higher education. In the second circle, in the new circle, people are talking about how, are we, how, how is it that UM is still behind NUS? <clears throat> or how is it that we are not in the top 100 uh, university ranking and so on and so forth? In the first circle, uh, the argument about higher education, I mean, the, the discussion will be who will be the next VC of University of Malaya. In the second circle, the issue will be how is the VC of University of Malaya elected or appointed? So it's a different way of looking at things. Yeah? Unfortunately for us in BN, we are still struggling in trying to address issues in the new kind of hope in the new circle, in the democratic hope. That is why if you were to look at the, if you were to map out the places where BN win and where PKR win in GE 13, then you will see probably if you were to use this circle then in constituencies where majority of the electorates thought that developmental hope is more important. This is where BN won. Whereas in constituencies where majority of the electorate thought that democratic hope is more important, these are the areas where uh, Pakatan Rakyat won. I am using now uh, something that was a research done by my friends in UMC Dell, the University of Malaya uh, Center for Democracy and Election. It's headed by Professor Ridwan Osman. When he mapped out the areas or the constituencies, parliamentary constituencies, where there is a high presence of probably um, well-educated people, or let's put it this way, where there are universities and university colleges, because Malaysian universities and colleges are spread out. So looking at Peninsula Malaysia, there are about 49 constituencies, parliamentary constituencies with universities and university colleges. Pakatan won 33, BN won 16. That's another way of looking at it, yeah? besides the urban and the rural. So if you look at constituencies with universities or college universities, there are 49, BN won 16, Pakatan won 33. 
So <clears throat> who constitute, who are people in the second circle, the democratic hope? I think they are, I call them the middle ground, or they are the middle ground uh, part of the uh, second circle. Uh, I think the AP or some members of the opposition use the term middle Malaysia. We can debate about this. Uh, and the, the, these people are also uh, known as, some of them are known as atas paga, undecided waters, or on the fence, depending on how you look at it, yeah? But I call them the middle ground, though I'm not trying to stereotype people. They are, firstly, uh, the young voters, uh, young professionals, uh, urban. So they are young university students. Yeah. Second will be the professionals, the technocrats. Third will be teachers and lecturers. Fourth will be entrepreneurs. Fifth will be uh, civil society activists. Yeah. How many of them? Uh, according to UMC Dell, they constitute about 30% of the electorate. Uh, if you look at the AP's numbers, uh, I think they are looking at about 4 million. So these are the real swing. Are they dominantly Chinese? Not necessarily. Because there are lots of Malays and Indians and other ethnics in that, that belongs to that group. Now, so it is transitional because here you have a contestation of the two circles, two kind of hopes. I'm aware that there are many other ways of looking at the uh, GE13 outcome or results, but I am very confident about one thing, that the first circle, the, tr the more traditional way of looking at election and politics, the developmental hope, the size is shrinking, that's for sure. Whereas the new circle, the democratic hope, is growing. And this can be seen clearly, as I said, from the 1999 general election. How is it that this circle, the new circle, is growing? This is due to the new realities occurring in Malaysia like any other countries in the world. And I would like to divide these new realities into two parts. The first is new realities that are universal in nature. Second, new realities that are very specific to the Malaysian context, though they are not peculiar only to Malaysia. What are the three new realities that are universal? Number one, the advent of the ICT and the new media. Uh, we all know about Facebook and the power of the internet uh, and so on and so forth. Is GE13 the first social media election in Malaysia? Yes and no. Yes, because I think for the 30%, they get their information, they do their sharing mostly online. Some of them has actually switched off from mainstream media. To, some peop to most people in the first circle, the new media is an alternative media. To most people in the second circle, the new media is the only media. <laughs> because they have switched off from Utusan Malaysia, BH, probably they still read new Sinaharian and Malay Mail, and they probably follow the news and the talk shows at Avani. Otherwise, it's Malaysia Insider, Malaysia Kini, FZ.com, Free Malaysia Today, uh, Durian FM Radio, uh, Mob TV, Internet, uh, what else? Uh, many others, yeah. Uh, the second new realities, a new reality that is uh, universal in nature is the rise of new kind of social consciousness among citizens of the world. Uh, people are questioning values, not that, that, not that they are valueless or valueless, 
they are simply questioning old values. They are giving new definitions to things like patriotism, like nationalism. Uh, people are talking about new values like integrity. Not that integrity is totally new, but people talk about it more and in the open. Uh, no, no issue seems to be sensitive. Uh, people just can't buy argument. Oh, you can't discuss this. This is too sensitive. They say nothing is sensitive to the extent that you can't discuss it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, people are, as I said, questioning old values. They are talking about new values, or rather, they are giving new definition to old values. The civil society uh, is becoming stronger and civil society is moving in or on non-traditional lines. Uh, you don't really have to register an organization. Uh, you, you, you can just group together. In fact, your Facebook group is an organization by itself. You don't have to register. No one can declare it illegal because it, it uh, see, the term legal uh, is important, but not everything needs to be legal. So you just don't, uh, you know, declare things illegal just because they are not registered. Yeah, people are more aware about laws and regulations, and they question some of the premises of uh, the laws and regulations. Uh, there is this debate between whether law is simply arid doctrines or law is actually foundation for something bigger or for society. So there are, that is the second one. The third one is, I think, we are moving into the third stage of democracy. I'm borrowing from Graham Smith and uh, Russell Dalton here. What is the third stage of democracy? When you no longer uh, look at democracy in the normative uh, term, that people come and vote every five years and then you sit back and let the government decide. No, the new, the third stage of democracy is when people call for more participatory, deliberative, consultative kind of democracy. People want to be part and parcel of the uh, processes and structures of decision making. Hence, there is a need for innovations in democracy and so on and so forth. But besides the three universally uh, occurring new realities, there are three very specific new, reali new realities occurring in Malaysia also. Not necessarily this is the first time it's happening or the first time people are looking at it, but it is giving its impact in the real sense of the word. One is urbanization. Uh, Malaysian urbanization is not going to go slow, it's going to be faster. Uh, more and more young voters are staying in the urban area and come back to vote. And that can change the whole voting pattern. In the next GE, not only more and more young people will be coming back to vote on the eve of election day, but small towns will become bigger towns. Temerlu, my constituency, could become a small city by that time. Yeah. Second is, uh, more and more people are becoming well-educated. Somebody was jokingly telling me the other day, he said, Din, you know what is the best recipe to ensure BN will win in GE14? I said, yes, tell me. Close all universities. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you have more educated people, people are more well-educated, they, they, they just don't take things uh, as it is. They, they will question. They, they, you know, the government has no longer has the monopoly of information, that's, that's for sure, but also uh, government has no more monopoly of what is true and what is not true. And that's very important. Yeah? Information is one thing, but the definition of truth is another. Third is, of course, uh, 
Um, what's the third one? <laughs> I have urbanization. I have uh, education. Okay, the third one is the middle class. And now I'm using the, 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 the term middle class like we, we normally use it. Yeah. The middle class will be growing in terms of size and, 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 and numbers. Yeah. And they are not necessarily residing only in the urban area. The trend is the middle class nowadays love to stay at the outskirts of the bigger cities. So that is why you will see more and more people who used to stay in Kuala Lumpur, right in the center of the city, now buying properties in areas like Gomba. Yeah? Going down to, on the way to Seremban. Uh, so you might see more and more. So this is the Greater KL. Yeah? And you have here yeah, also looking at the Greater Georgetown, the Greater Ipoh, the Greater Kuantan. So partly it's urbanization. Uh, as a process, partly the middle class are no longer staying you know, in Kenny Hill, in Bangsa, in Damansara Heights, they are moving out because they want a better place, less pollution, less uh, traffic jam, and so on and so forth. I mean, these are, uh, I think, universal characteristic of an affluent society. Yeah, you have a choice. You want to go out. You want to. You want to. You know. You want a, a better, uh, 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 health, a healthier lifestyle. So, six features under new realities are occurring. They were there uh, in the previous two or three general election, but the impact is so real this time around, and the impact is going to be greater in GE 14. The other thing which is interesting uh, in the GE 13, again, not the first time it happened, but it happened in the in, in, you know, it is more visible, is that uh, this is interesting because on the one hand, we, we are looking at some numbers, we are looking at analysts saying that there is so much polarization in GE13. But at the same time, on the other hand, I think more Malaysians are becoming colorblind when it comes to voting. I give you a personal experience, something that I was sharing with Dr. U yesterday. I was contesting in Tamerloh. Tamerloh is 50% uh, urban and 50% rural. The composition of the electorate is classic. It's Malaysia, 64-25, uh, 9-2. You know, it's, it's, it's exactly, almost exactly Malaysia. It's, yeah, an average, uh, it's a Malaysian average. Yeah. Size of electorate, also interesting, 66,217. I lost by 1,070. Okay. During the election, I saw for the first time in Tamerlo, maybe it has happened in other places in the last GE, but for the first time in Tamerlo, DAP flags in Malay Kampongs. Yeah. When I saw that in a few kampong, I was telling my friend, as an AMNO and BN candidate, I smell trouble. <laughs> Never mind that the DAP candidate in Mentakap, which is the don, the, the state seat under Temulu Parliamentary Constituency, is a Malay guy by the name of Tengku Zafro, but is a DAP flat in a Malay kampong. I say, okay, this is trouble, yeah. But as a Democrat, I look at it differently. Now, is this a signal that Malaysians are becoming more colorblind? So I had mixed feeling. Yeah, I know I'm gonna. Be, I I probably at that time I thought, okay, I'm gonna kalala, I'm gonna lose, yeah. But as a Democrat, okay, I think we have to look at this seriously. And when you look at the fact that the AP has got more. Indian MPs in Parliament compared to uh, MIC. 
and PAS has fielded a non-Muslim for the first time. Uh, now, these are big challenges for UMNO and Pakistan National. That is why I say I'm not going to contest whether colorblind is bigger than polarization, no. All I'm saying is more and more Malaysians are becoming colorblind. And let me put before you another statistic. This is from UKM, KITA. KITA UKM, the Institute for Ethnic Relations under Professor Shamsul Amri. They did the research last year in 20 different districts or constituencies in Peninsula Malaysia, trying to understand how Malaysians look at unity. One of the questions was, are you more comfortable in declaring yourself, yourself as a Malaysian or as a Malay Chinese Indian, etc. 60% of the respondents replied saying that I'm more comfortable in calling myself I'm Malaysia first. Second Malay, second Indian, second things like that. So that, that is the two numbers that I have. One, well, one number from Kita UKM. You can, you can address that later, perhaps, or you can invite uh, Shamsul. The other one is my personal experience. And this, I found out later that this happened not only in Temerloh, it happened uh, in many other places. So what's next for AMNO and BN and Malaysia? First of all, AMNO is facing our GE, uh, our, our own uh, election. Uh, we have not announced officially when it is going to be held. The AMNO branch meetings, uh, AMNO branches will start their meetings 15th of July until 30th of August. The actual election of the Supreme Council is either in October or November. My guess is it is in November. Yeah. But this time we are using a new uh, system. The old system is when you have less than 3,000 delegates to the AMNO Assembly in Kuala Lumpur voting for the Supreme Council. We have amended the constitution. This is part of Najib's uh, political transformation. As soon as he became president, he, he moved the idea to amend the constitution whereby it is no longer less than 3,000 delegates voting, but delegates to all 191 divisions of AMNO throughout Malaysia, except Sarawak, because we don't have AMNO in Sarawak, will be voting for the Supreme Council. So you're looking at about 150,000 to 160,000 delegates voting. We have about 3 million members. Delegates to the division means they represent the thousands of branches. So branch elect their delegates, delegates go to the division, and you vote at the divisional meetings. Um, will there be a contest for the top post? We have to wait. Lah. Because the new system say anyone who wants to contest for any position in the Supreme Council can just go and register yourself. So until the registration is closed, you won't know. Last time it used to be division have to nominate. And then there is a quota. Lah. For president, you need how many percent. For deputy president, you need how many percent. For vice president and so on, you need how many percent of uh, 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 what do you call it? nominations? Yeah. But this time, so long as there is a nominator and a seconder, I guess you are eligible to contest. So we will have to wait. Uh, I am expecting our Supreme Council meeting the, on the last Friday of this month. Uh, then we will get to know probably the dates of the. Uh, 
voting and the actual uh, system that we will uh, carry out this time. My guess is there will be no contest for the top post. My guess is uh, Najib will be returned unopposed as president. Unless, of course, someone thinks that Najib has done very badly uh, in the last GE. There is a difference between uh, Najib's position and Tun Abdullah's position. I mean, after uh, the GE. In 2008, AMNO cannot accept that we lost to third majority. This time, we have lowered the bar, so to speak, even before GE 13. <laughs> so, lower expectation. Yeah. But AMNO did much better as a party in GE 13 compared to, to 2008. Uh, we won more seats this time, 88 compared to 79 at Parliament. We got back Kedah and uh, we got back Perak. I, I, there, was, there was this uh, argument, what do you mean by you got back Perak? You retain para. I say, Kamala, to be fair, we lost para before we, we somehow got it back. So we say, we got back para lah, to, be, to, be more, to be more candid about it. Lah, you know? uh, or rather to show we do better. Lah, you know? So we got back para. But interestingly, uh, we are not uh, popular vote-wise. We lost in Kedah and para. Yeah, In Kedah, BN won 21 seats, but we won only 49% of the popular vote. In Perak, we won 31 seats, but we won only 43% of the popular vote. Now, coming to this popular vote, uh, there is a trend that somehow BN's popular vote is on the decline, or was on the decline, uh, since uh, 1995. In 1995, we were like 65%, and then 63.9 in 99. In 2004, even though we won 90% of the seats in parliament, our biggest win, but the decline in the popular vote was already there uh, by one point compared to 19. 99, 2008, 50.2%, and uh, this time, uh, 47%. Now, is it possible for BN to check the slide? It is, because we have done it before. Uh, we had our lowest popular vote in 1969, only 49 for 49.3 percent. In the next GE 1974, we got 60 percent, 60.7 percent of the popular vote. There was a yo-yo, 74, 78, and 82. We were up, we were down, we were up again. So there is a possibility that we can check. Coming to the issue of Chinese tsunami, for instance, yes, perhaps 90 percent of the Chinese did not vote for BN this time but it was the Chinese voters who saved BN in 1999 general election when we had problems with Malay votes. 2004, the Chinese were voting for us. 2008, we probably lost majority of the Indian votes. So if we can manage to get back the support of the Malays and the Indians in, 2000, in, in the last GE, so who says that uh, we will never get the Chinese vote back. So that is why I keep on saying there is a big difference in looking at numbers and statistics as, okay, how many Chinese vote, how many Chinese did not vote, and blaming the Chinese, yeah, two different things. You can look at it as, as an academic exercise, as an analyst, yeah, but you don't blame because nothing is permanent in politics. Yeah, nothing is permanent. You can always you can always get the Chinese vote back. If we care to reach out and to talk to the Chinese and to, yeah. So AMNO election is coming at the end of the year. Um, 
what is even more important is not so much about the top two position, but the whole uh, Supreme Council. Are we going to get more progressive people on board or are we not going to get more progressive people on board? Yeah. So, for instance, I would like to see, uh, I, I would like to hope that Raman Dahlan will contest because he's not yet a member of the Supreme Council. I hope he will contest and win. I would also like to see people like uh, Nojazlan, the MP for Pulai, yeah, who is not in the cabinet, even though he's an ordinary MP, but I hope he will contest and win uh, in the Supreme Council. <coughs> even people like Shari Samad, uh, a veteran politician in Amno, but I think this is someone who is extraordinary in the sense that he understands both circles very well. He's a master of the first circle. Yeah, I'm sure you all know him. <laughs> but at the same time, he is well adept. He understands what is happening in the in the second circle. For MCA, I think many of us are hoping that MCA will do an EGM uh, where they will change their decision. But of course, I understand in MCA there are the two schools. One saying, hey, this is our pride. We have said before that we're not, we are not going to be part of government if we, didn't, if we don't do well. Yeah. So I'm sure there will be this uh, debate in MCA. The other one, the other school are saying, we can't have, we can't, we just can't have uh, a BN government with no MCA uh, representative. So this, this I, I really leave it to the, to my colleagues in MCA. We are not going to be involved, but I support the idea because this idea is also coming from MCA that they should do their EGM. What do BN do? There was this idea about BN becoming a single party. I actually support the idea that BN should be a single party, but I'm also aware of the fact that AMNO will not give in. Yeah. And I don't think uh, Sabah and Sarawak, especially Sarawak, PBB, will give in to the idea because they won't be. So there's no reason why for them to go uh, to dissolve their parties and become uh, and become the end single party, uh, but I support it as an ideal. Yeah. So perhaps the alternative will be for the end to start direct membership. In our current system, to be a member of the end, an individual to be a member of the end, you have to be a member of a particular component party. Most of our component parties are race-based party. They are not racist. Uh, there is a big difference between race-based and racist. You don't have to be a member of AMNO to be a Malay racist or Malay chauvinist and so on and so forth. Yeah? So most of our parties are in BN are race-based. Uh, but outside the end, as I said earlier, more and more Malaysians are becoming colorblind. Our opposition members, both uh, all PKR, PAS, and uh, DAP, seems to be quite successful to a certain extent in trying to show to people that they are colorblind. They are really multiracial. Our multiracial party in BN would be, the two famous one would be Gerakan and PPP, but they didn't do well. I'm being very politically correct here. Yeah. They didn't do well. Besides, they didn't really show that they are really multiracial. Yeah. Gerakan seems to be more Chinese and PPP seems to be more Indian, unfortunately. But they are registered as a multiracial party. Yeah. So direct membership is perhaps the answer. For 
Several reasons, because number one, people are becoming more colorblind. Number two, among the civil society today, and this is not just after GE, even for the last few years, the main discussion within the civil society circle are, number one, move away from race-based policies to need-based policies. Inclusive development, participatory development. Yeah. So the, narrates, the discourses are, are moving away from BN structure. So BN have to adapt to that. Politically speaking, BN has to adapt to that. Yeah. The other thing is, what happens if some members, okay, this can become, you know, can become an issue within BN, but what if there are uh, members of the BN who think that their parties are no longer strong enough for them to be a member of or for them to be active in, what is the option? At least you put an option, you give an option. Yes, you can become a member of a direct uh, BN club or something as an individual. More importantly, more and more young people are coming from mixed marriages. Of course, uh, the percentage is still small, but when you couple that with people being colorblind, people moving away from race-based politics and race-based policies to more need-based politics and need-based policies, uh, this is something that you cannot underestimate. I was in business before I become full-time politician. I have about 70 team members in my organization, and half of them can't tell you whether I'm a Malay, Chinese, or Indian. My CEO told me, say, Abandin, you see, I support BN. He said, I like BN. But I can't be a member of any of the political parties within BN. I said, why? My father is Indian, my mother is Chinese, I'm married to a mama from Penang. So tell me which party I should be a member of. I said, Gerakan MPP lah, uh, PPP lah, uh, Hayo, Abandin, as if you don't know. So I said, okay. These are people who are willing to support BN, who likes the idea of BN, yeah, for whatever reason, but they are not comfortable to be a member of any of our component parties for various reasons. And I thought, rather than, rather than allowing them with no options, except <laughs> the other side of the house, it is perhaps better to give them to give them an option, you be a member of direct BN. But it is not just about the structure of the organization. What is even more pressing is to change our political culture. I think we have to look at new politics. I must uh, declare my interest. That is the title of my book, which I published in 2008. <laughs> it started with me writing in BH uh, in 2006 about neopolitics. And I think there are four things that BN has to look at very seriously. Number one is the question of integrity. I mean, BN as a party and BN as a government, yeah? Number one, the question of integrity. Number two, we need to establish some kind of new uh, governance structure, which includes, of course, uh, issues of good governance, but good governance to me uh, is under integrity. What do I mean by new governance structure? I think we have to be more consultative in the way we do things. Uh, to me, there are three main stakeholders in modern democracy like Malaysia. One is the state, second is the business, third is the civil society. These three stakeholders must actually be able to work closely together. And because the state is the one that is legitimate, I think the onus is on the state to invite the other two stakeholders to the, negotiate, uh, to the table to discuss things yeah, in a more transparent manner, uh, in, a, in a more, I mean, to, to really uh, uh, realize the notion of genuine uh, partnership or smart partnership. Third is innovations in democracy. I think Dr. Najib did very well in the transformation program, uh, particularly in the way we decide on 
the GTP, the Government Transformation Program, and the ETP, the uh, Economic Transformation Program. It's no longer the Prime Minister Department and central agencies making decisions, but you invite thousands of people, months of deliberation. I thought that was some kind of uh, uh, innovations in democracy, which, uh, which, which was uh, lauded by many people. And the last one would be uh, more progressive thinking uh, in the way we do things. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, those are my <laughs> sharing. I, I know I have exceeded. I promise him I will speak not more than 40 minutes. But you know, politicians, <laughs> you should have invited me to say just a few words rather than <laughs> giving a speech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dato. Well, I said at least 40 minutes. I <laughs> Um, well, we, we do have um, quite some time for q and I'm sure you, you have loads of questions about the elections and, and uh, Dato's analysis of it, all, all the different dimensions that played in. And the future, of course, the future will be about structural changes, especially within the BN and UMNO, really. Um, so I'll open the floor now to questions, hands up. Uh, yeah, keep your questions short, state your name and affiliation. Um, good morning. My name is Mong Sik Chun. Thank you for a very interesting and enlightening uh, speech. Um, just, just a few comments, which I is my personal views. I may be way off the mark, but just a few comments is that one of the issues that, uh, as you have mentioned, is um, the first two C. I think those the first two C is the main problem. Right, that uh, the most uh, Malaysians are concerned with. And my view is that uh, the first two C arise or given opportunity to arise is mainly because of the NEP policy. Because of NEP, uh, a lot of uh, so called opportunities were given up to certain sectors of people who will benefit under the pretext of NEP. So if the N where is the chance of NEP being amended, if not abolished, to get to provide a level playing field? And the other one is the university quota system. Right? Because Malays are being the majority. And a lot of Malays are capable to fend for themselves. If the quota system is there, it provides a crush mentality, and therefore you have a lot of people who depends on this to actually get themselves in. And this provides the general public with a concern that you know, they do, their, their opportunities are being deprived. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we'll try to take two or three questions for, for Dato to answer in a sweep. Um, any other questions? Yes, please. Okay. Um, uh, good morning. Thank you, first of all, for that very wonderful presentation. My name is Afi from RSIS. Uh, my question is, um, uh, when you talk about just now on um, uh, the need for structural reforms, for instance, um, uh, even within AMNO itself, um, what about the more sentimental reforms? Um, for instance, um, when, uh, the issue of ETP, um, uh, was uh, being brought forward by the Prime Minister. Um, there was opposition from within Amnon itself, and uh, what I'm referring to explicitly is between the, those more liberal voices, perhaps within Amno and also the more conservative. So perhaps you can shed some light on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, After okay. the just, just, uh, my name is Ong Jin Kiet, and a quick one, there's been no mention about the electoral boundaries, which obviously is something that will you know, be always brought up in the future. Mm. Mm. Yeah, okay, one, one more then. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Saifurin, thank you for coming here and give us your thoughts. Uh, I just have two questions. Liberals like you in AMNO 
I don't know whether what is the likelihood of your future in Amno, people like you. <laughs> I mean, this is a quite a serious question. <laughs> and secondly, would it be better, like when I look at your the, your speeches, your thoughts, it fit more people like in the PKR or DAP. So I think it's quite a, a struggle for you. Uh, having this kind of uh, liberal and yet in a party which is very conservative and even sometimes extreme. <laughs> or it could it be just a strategy of PN Najib that you are a very good PR and a hope <laughs> to get back the support for MCA and MIC. I don't know whether that is the, the strategy in the mind of the AMNO leadership. Thank you very much. Okay. You, you come full answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which one to answer first now. Okay. Let's get the easy one. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you uh, for the questions. Uh, do we have to do, do, in exam, we don't have to answer all questions right now. <laughs> yeah, so long as you get 51% of the mark, you're yeah, okay. <laughs> Simple majority. I'm not looking for two thirds. <laughs> uh, yeah, cronyism and corruption, they are two in one and one in two, like both sides of the coin. Whether this is because of the NEP, I don't think it's because of the NEP. If at all, if at all it is related to NEP, then it is because of the implementation of the NEP. Yeah, I, I think we, we, we are on the same wavelength uh, on that one. Yes, uh, we have issues on people who are simply rent seekers. I think Dato' Najib has, uh, has spoke about this, yeah. Uh, we, there are two, two answers to you, uh, sir. One is, I think we, we, we have, you know, put aside NAP. Uh, we are now coming up with, we have come up with new economic model, the NEM. Uh, it was, it was uh, very much, the work, the work was led by Tan Sri Amisham, uh, Amisham, uh, very notable uh, banker, then became a minister under Patlah uh, for a short while, then was asked to head the new economic uh, uh, action committee, NEAC, and his main task was to come up with uh, the NEM. <clears throat> I would recommend that we look at the NEM, and I think uh, perhaps uh, there are talks in KL now that we should actually relaunch uh, NEM now that election is over because there are lots of good things, good stuff uh, in the NEM. Uh, for instance, uh, even if we are, okay, we are looking at the, the three principles of the NEM is now, of course, uh, going for high income state, uh, sustainability and inclusiveness. Inclusiveness includes looking at the 40% uh, of the people who are unfortunately at the bottom of the pyramid, but we are looking at new kind of affirmative actions. If at all, affirmative action is still needed. Uh, I think we are looking seriously into uh, approaches like uh, social entrepreneurship. So it's not about giving handouts to poor people, but actually to empower the poor. We, we are not without any success stories. We have, for instance, Amana Iftia Malaysia, which is actually a, a template uh, of uh, Grameen Bank, but we have been very successful. What needs to be done now is to, uh, to graduate the people under AIM uh, scheme uh, so that they can actually be uh, truly uh, independent and out of the, uh, out of the uh, poverty uh, uh, line. Uh, but what is more important is uh, what do we do about it? Yeah. I think, to be fair to Najib, uh, he did not deny the fact that corruption is a serious thing. That is why corruption is one of the six original uh, uh, focus areas or the national key result areas under the government transformation program. I think we have publicly admitted that this is a serious uh, issue. And to date, I think we have put up some uh, system into the government machinery, bureaucracy. For instance, there is now uh, what is known as the uh, integrity index, where every procurement have to be packed uh, 
uh, to the integrity index and about 82 percent or probably more by now uh, government uh, procurements are already packed to this uh, integrity index yeah uh, so there is an effort uh, there is a serious effort in doing this kind of thing uh, in trying to combat uh, corruption but yes more needs to be done and even in the gtp uh, beyond uh, 20, i think uh, a few more new initiatives will be announced soon because already in the in 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 the existing uh, government transformation program, uh, in as far as uh, combating corruption is concerned, there is uh, two or three other new initiatives uh, that will be looked at. Uh, other than that, I would like to say two more things that needs to be done. Number one, I think um, uh, on the government side, we have to to practice more uh, spend management technologies, uh, to be specific, to use more of the uh, e-bidding and e-procurement technology where it is 100% online, it's very transparent, uh, with minimum uh, human intervention. So when you, have, when you minimize uh, human intervention in the whole process, then you minimize the possibilities of uh, of uh, of corruption occurring, yeah. So we need to do that. The other thing is, I think it is about time. <laughs> Late is better than ever, but it's about time we seriously address the issue of political financing. Uh, I think Gomez, uh, Professor Gomez, have done a paper or probably uh, a, a, a study on political financing. I think this is something that both sides of the house, yeah, both sides of the house have to address seriously. Uh, we have actually stopped uh, officially using university quota in the last years of Mahadi administration. Uh, entry to public universities are now based on uh, meritocracy. The main issue now is actually quality uh, education. Yeah? Uh, we want to ensure that our universities are taught by the best and produce the best. Uh, and as always, you know, uh, we look at Singapore universities very closely, very jealously, and and uh, if we can't beat the others, we, call, we keep on telling ourselves, you know, if you can't beat the others, you must be at par with our uh, contemporaries uh, uh, across the causeway. Yeah, so we 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 must do that. Now. Uh, Yes, there was uh, some debates between, you know, uh, people in government about the uh, ETP because the economic transformation program is quite liberal, actually. Yeah, opening up of companies. In fact, in the BN manifesto, uh, there is a, a, a statement on looking or reviewing uh, the GLCs. Uh, I don't have privy to what was what what it actually mean. Yeah, uh, what is the meaning of reviewing GLC? But there have been talks about you know we have to look at the GLC. Um, for instance, uh, some GLC seems to be doing very well, some not doing very well. So perhaps we have to look at that. But there is there is going to be no end. Uh, the debate between the conservative and the liberal. Uh, I'm mindful of the fact that there's no real definition of conservative and liberal in Malaysia, but you know there is always the old guts, new guts. Again, there's no real definition. Uh, but yes, uh, there are people who wants to safeguard and make sure that the Malay and the Bumi Putra uh, will not lose out in the uh, business, in, in, in privatization projects, corporatization projects, and so on and so forth. But there are also a growing number of Malays and Bumiputra who say, look, look uh, we, we, are, uh, we are capable of doing it. Yeah. Uh, I have seen, I remember there was this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, chit chat with uh, a young uh, university student from University of Malaya, a Malay girl. Uh, there were a few of us. Uh, I must qualify that. There were a few of us. <laughs> Deputy Minister talking to a Malay girl, oh, bahaya, you know. <laughs> there, were, there were a number of us. So then I asked her, I said, where are you from? I said, I'm from UM. Which faculty law? So I looked at her, wow, very good. And then he quickly 
Can you imagine a Malay girl talking to a Malay deputy minister, minister like this? Sir, I came in on merit, okay? Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. You know what that means? Because there are a growing number of Malays, young professionals, who are telling the world, look, I'm here because I earned it. Yeah. Not that they are not being thankful to the quota system of the old days. They are simply saying, I'm here because they sometimes perhaps feel embarrassed, I don't know. Because they might think that, or oh, you think I'm here in UM, UM, law faculty some more? No, no, I'm not there because I'm a win cable candidate. Yeah, but because I'm, I, I earn it. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I will then go to the next question. I, I skip the delineation thing first. How many people are liberal in Amno? <laughs> uh, like any other organization, sir if I may submit. There is always the liberal and the progressive and the reformists and whatever you call them. And the number is always the small minority. Not only minority, the adjective is there, small minority. The big majority is always the yes, Mr. President. I think in, in our context, yeah, probably not in, the, not in the Europe, not in Europe and the US, but in our context, yeah, majority will be the yes, Mr. President. And you have another uh, part of the organization, which are the old guards, the conservative, the hardliners, whatever you call it, who would resist change some way or the other. Whoever is the president, they will say, oh, it has to be status quo and so on and so forth. Would it be better for me to join Pakatan Rakyat? No, thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, yeah, I joined AMNO in 1986. I graduated from UM in 1984. At that moment in time, what choice do I have? Uh, AMNO is part of uh, BN. I believe in uh, multiracial politics. Uh, so the choice was BN. And because I was a Malay, I, I'm Malay, so uh, Ahli AMNO, lah. you become a member of AMNO. Uh, why don't I join Pakatan Rakyat? No, I believe uh, the struggle for new politics and what well, all principal politics or whatever you call it can come from many ways from many angles yeah so it's okay lah. Uh, some of my friends are in Pakatan they were with me in uh, in university or in the youth uh, movement uh, then uh, they work through Pakatan I work in Amno uh, what is my future in Amno it depends lah <laughs> I'm a, I was a rookie MP uh, first time uh, in, in GE 2008. I won with 2,400 uh, 2, votes. I lost this time with 1,070 votes in the GE. I stand for the first time in AMNO Supreme Council last time uh, and I got 15, number 15 out of 25. Not bad for a rookie and for someone who openly admitted that I don't spend money uh, in getting uh, my seat in AMNO Supreme Council member. But this time around, uh, it may be tougher because the system has changed. And number two, last time maybe, you see, most AMNO members, when they vote for Supreme Council, uh, they have their list in their mind. Yeah? First ministers, deputy ministers. So I was lucky uh, last time. This time, I'm not going to be very lucky. Yeah. A former or an ex uh, is not going to be easy. Yeah. Number two, last time they don't, know, they don't really know me. You know? Who is this Saifuddin? Don't know. La. Young people, la. young boy, la. can la. give him a chance. La. You know? After all, he's the deputy minister. Okay. Oh, he comes from Pahang. Uh, Najib's place. Maybe he's Najib's man. Maybe. He looks like Najib also. <laughs> so maybe. Yeah. So give him a chance. La. So I won. La. Yeah. This time, he lost already, wa. yeah. And then, what is this new politics he's talking about? Uh, we don't need this new politics. You see, we did well, wa, this time. Uh, without the new politics, I don't know. So, it's tougher. For me, it's tougher this time. Uh, okay. The EC, and uh, thank God, uh, at last we have announced that the EC will uh, report to Parliament. Uh, 
from now onwards uh, though the actual date has not yet to not yet announced uh, which is good um, but delineation process is going to be interesting yeah the issue of uh, gerrymandering has to be addressed I'm not admitting that we do it, yeah, okay. I'm saying the issue of gerrymandering has to be addressed because people accuse the EC, not us, the EC of gerrymandering. So we have to address the issue. Um, and, and, and this is already long overdue. So it's going to be interesting how, how we look at uh, Because uh, there are two schools here. First, they say you don't need to add number of seats. You can just play around with 222 parliamentary seat, but so long as you lessen the number of voters in places like PJ Utara, PJ Selatan, uh, 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 Sepute, and Kapar, Kampar, and others, and uh, and so on and so forth, so you can get a more balanced uh, numbers for majority of the parliamentary constituencies. Uh, so you don't need to amend constitution because you amend constitution if you if you need to add number of seats. But others are saying you still have to add the number of seats. So because of that, you need to amend constitution. In order to amend the constitution, you need uh, a two-third majority, which we don't have. And because of that, we need to negotiate with our friends in the opposition. Whatever it is, I think it's going to be exciting time. So you have MCA election, you have AMNO election, you have MIC election, you have delineation of new parliamentary and state assembly uh, constituency. So, so we will have a field day analyzing what's going to happen <laughs> for the next few months. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you have a question? Um, okay, Moose first. Yeah. Uh, Mustafa Izuddin, ISIS. Uh, thank you, Dato, for a very realistic and uh, progressive presentation. I think you will hear the progressive word quite a bit. Uh, Singapore. Uh, as you are in Singapore, allow me to ask you a Singapore question. Uh, a uh, probably two, a slightly naughty one and a uh, a more uh, diplomatic, open-ended one. Uh, why, in your view, uh, has Singapore featured quite prominently in the Malaysian elections? Uh, even, perhaps even more pronounced or more prominent than the GE12 uh, in 2008. Um, and more broadly, and this is the sort of more open-ended question, what is your assessment of uh, Malaysia-Singapore relations especially under the uh, Prime Minister Najib administration. Thank you. James? Uh, thank you, Dato. James Chin from ISIS. Uh, just a very quick question. As you know, uh, last week, the, the, the what they call it, the Non-Muslim Religious Council, MACH, issued a statement uh, regarding the uh, hot issue of conversion. Uh, they claimed that the cabinet decision that was taken two years ago was, was not implemented by the bureaucracy. I'm just wondering, can you tell us uh, what is the dynamics of, of religion that plays in terms of uh, AMNO politics and also the wider public policy framework? Because I think uh, it's clear that uh, religious issues is becoming a bigger, bigger cleavage among the population. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um Sorry, I'm not in dress code. Uh, I forgot about it. <laughs> um, but before I start, um, I'd just like to tell you that uh, a lot of the Tamalo voters are actually quite pissed at themselves for voting you out. <laughs> um, yeah. But anyway, um, I'd just like to ask you a question on Satu Malaysia, because that's Najib's tagline. Um, during the elections, he uh, fielded Zulkifli Nordin, uh, Vice President of Perkasa. Um, in uh, Pasemas, there's uh, Ibrahim Ali, was allowed to contest directly against his past opponent with the BN candidate withdrawing at the last time. Um, how is this reflective of the Satu Malaysia slogan that Najib has been preaching? Um, the second thing is with regards to education. Um, in Malaysia, there is, a, there is a discourse now about um, the quality of human capital that's being produced. 
And um, from my experience with uh, Teach for Malaysia, one of my friends is a fellow. Um, he's saying he's teaching in uh, a place called uh, Batu Kurau, which is uh, near Taiping. And from what my observations are, Malaysian schools are very well equipped with the hardware, but the software is just not there. And in, ref and in reply to your um, answer on meritocracy to ad in admission to public universities, sure, at public universities, things are so-called more meritocratic now. But if you look underneath, you'll still see things like matriculacy. you still see things which are based on quota. Um, how are these things be going to be addressed? And is this really a reflection of meritocracy in Malaysia? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> oh, questions are becoming tougher. What time do we stop? <laughs> Um, okay, so why is Singapore featured more prominently in the coming GE13? I think I understand there are about 400,000 Malaysians who, who commute uh, in and out of Singapore uh, because they work here. And that, I think we are very thankful to our friends in Singapore for welcoming Malaysians uh, as, a, as a workforce. But more interestingly, more interestingly uh, when it comes to GE13, I think is the number of Malaysians uh, who reside in Singapore or who works in Singapore, I think who works in Singapore rather, who register to vote and came back to vote. Look at Gelampata as an example. I don't know the exact number, but I'm told there are about 13,000 uh, voters uh, who are actually working in Singapore and they come and vote in Galampata and many came back to their hometowns uh, to vote uh, this time. So the biggest overseas voters for GE13 is naturally from Singapore. Lah, yeah? So uh, is this a good sign? Yes, because they are participating in our GE. I think that is of number one importance. Yeah, I Of course I wish they would for BN because I, we don't know who they are voting for. Yeah, But I hope some of them uh, vote for BN also. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Malaysia-Singapore relations I suppose is perhaps at its best. I think the true Prime Ministers are enjoying a very cordial uh, relationship. Uh, for some of our uh, friends who have been following Malaysian Singapore, Malaysia Singapore uh, relationship, uh, I'm sure you can watch for me that the two prime ministers, I think they are good friends, and you can't ask for more at this moment in time. Yeah. Um, how is religion and Islam, uh, basically that's what it is uh, in, in Malaysian politics. You see, uh, here is again, uh, I'm being very candid. You know, in 1999, uh, Amno faced a very strong uh, past, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, opposition. Uh, never was passed stronger than 1999. Of course, after that, there, there are the up and downs. Uh, yeah? But but 1999 was the first time pass came out very strongly. The Young Turks, lah, basically, under Haji Hadi. Yeah? And for the first time, you see, though not very clear at that time, but already, you know, well-educated professionals joining pass. So, they are becoming a very important opposition. Amno had a choice that time. Two choices. One is to be more Islamic than PAS. Number two, take a moderate approach. Thank God we took the second approach. We didn't, we didn't try to become more Islamic than PAS. So, um, 
sorry, it's not 99, sorry. Uh, past opposition came strong uh, in the late 70s. So 99 was the Anwar factor, yeah? Sorry, uh, I, I, I correct myself. Uh, the election just before Mahade came in as Prime Minister, yeah? That, you know, the, remember the Islamic revivalism of the 70s, yeah? So those, those, those time, yeah? Those time. And uh, Anwar was not yet in Amno. Yeah. So the role of Abim was very strong uh, those time. So yeah, it was Da'wah movement, revivalism of Islam. So books like, uh, what's the book? Zaina Anwar wrote the book. Uh, his, his, her, her, her master uh, uh, thesis was on the Da'wah movement among Muslim students looking at UM and things like that. So. So in the 70s. So when, that's why when Mahdi came in, the choice was whether we become more Islamic than past or we took a moderate path. And I think uh, Mahdi did the right choice, Amno did the right choice of not becoming, trying to become more Islamic than, than past. Uh, so for Islam, for, for past and Amno, there is always this contestation of, as to who serve Islam better, lah, let's put it that way. Yeah. When I say I, I, uh, I'm being very candid because uh, I'm quite happy to see past moving towards the center prior to GE13. Yeah. I can get into trouble, you know, now I'm placing past already. Just now you tell me I would rather join PKI and DAP, now you will say, why don't you join past? Yeah? <laughs> No, because now, now they are no longer talking about Hudud, though Hudud is always on their agenda, but at least in their pronouncement, uh, they are talking, they are going uh, to the center. Now, as a Malaysian and as a Muslim, anyone going to the center is good for the country and it's good for the religion, I mean for, 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 for the Muslim, for the Ummah. Yeah? What worries you is when people go to the right or when people go to the left. Anyone going to the center should be encouraged. Yeah? But it's a challenge to Amno lah, because Amno has always tried to take the center stage that we are the moderates. Now Pas is saying we are <laughs> also moderate, though they say in different ways. Yeah. So the 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 the, the challenge is who is going to be more persuasive. Uh, I mean, uh, as regard to winning votes lah. Yeah. Um, so that is, that is the thing. I think I think uh, Islam will feature. Uh, perhaps forever, uh, so long as you have Amno and Pass, but I'm very happy with the fact that uh, both Amno and Pass are now uh, going to the center, and I think that, that, that is good. Yeah? So it remains now to who defines it better, who does things better. So perhaps we should look at uh, how Kedah is going to fare compared to uh, Kelantan, for instance, because these are two very uh, Malay Muslim dominated states and of course uh, how uh, UMNO were to lead uh, Islamic issues uh, at the federal level yeah so then you will have you know uh, issues on conversion Kalima Allah these are going to be you know uh, the debate will, will, will not end uh, and there is no easy uh, solutions to it how I wish more and more scholars Muslim scholars will come out and speak up yeah, on this kind of issues. And uh, I think both sides of the divide should actually listen more to the scholars rather than... You see, the problem is always when... I'm not saying politicians should not speak on, on, on religious issues, but the problem is always when we speak on religious issues, whether what we are saying is right, even if when we say it right and we say the right things, uh, then there is always this perception, ah, this is already uh, political. So it's, it's quite difficult sometimes. So uh, I really hope that our scholars, the civil society, will come forward and speak up. We need more Dr. Asrila, to be, to be very frank. Yeah. We need more of the former Mufti Perlis, very progressive-minded, uh, very articulate, uh, good in uh, new media also. Uh, we need more 
uh, this kind of people. Dr. Jawanda is another leading figure uh, when it comes to this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, one Malaysia, uh, okay lah, Zulkifli Nordin Ibrahim Ali, I don't have privy to the reason why uh, things happen that way, but I think, uh, let's put it this way, election is short term, I think long term, one Malaysia is important, I think it has bear some fruit, I have uh, shared with you the result of the survey done by Kita UKM, I think one Malaysia is a good package, it's here to stay for as long as Najib is Prime Minister, I believe so. And, uh, and, and I think we look forward to more Malaysians uh, subscribing, not so much because it's from Najib, but uh, you know, uh, being comfortable calling ourselves Malaysians. Uh, I am not trying to say that polarization is no longer an issue. We need to look at that. We, we need to, 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 but you know, this, a, a new kind of conversation is needed lah, basically. Yeah, in trying to address uh, issues uh, relating to uh, uh, unity in Malaysia. I'll give an example. I know it is very romantic to say that close all vernacular schools and have only one uh, education system. I mean, uh, who don't want an easy way out? But it's not going to be easy because uh, at the same time, you have to address issues like parental choice. We have to address issues like uh, is unity achieved through uniformity? Uh, you, know, you know, when, when every time when people bring up this discourse on everything must be the same, like only one school, one medium of instruction, my, my rapid response will be, you mean to say to achieve unity, you must have uniformity, then we all have to become soldiers and policemen and we all have to wear uniforms. I, I am totally against uniformity. I am for choice. Yeah. And I think this is the way. Uh, forward. I mean, we are all born equal, but with all kinds of interests, you know. Uh, there is a Malay peribahasa kan, rambut sama hitam, <laughs> hati lain-lain, or rambut sama hitam, style lain-lain. <laughs> yeah? So, so we, 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 we have to be real in, in looking at these kind of issues. Education. Let, let, let's put it this way. Here is an opportunity for us to relook at our education system, philosophy, approaches in a big way. Uh, now that we have merged the two ministries, do you know that we have at least four education acts relating to Malaysian education system? We have the National Education Act that governs the school system, basically governs the school system. And for higher education, we have, I think, about three acts. One is the University and University College Act, basically governing public universities. And then we have the uh, Private Higher Education Act, basically governing private universities. Uh, and then we have another act, uh, Higher Education Act, which governs institutions like UITM, Polytechnics, and community colleges. The Ministry of Education, the former Ministry of, of Education, had conducted a one-year-long uh, series of town hall meetings involving close to 25,000 people from all walks of life and representing all the stakeholders in trying to review the uh, school system. They came up with proposal they call it the 11 new paradigms and so on and so forth, is about to be implemented. My former boss, uh, Dr. Sri Khalid Nordin, the former Minister of Higher Education, now Chief Minister, Menteri Besar of, 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 of Johor, uh, beginning this year have announced that uh, we need to review the higher education system, uh, not just the ranking but the whole notion of quality. 
So I think this isn't here, and here is an opportunity for for us to look at the uh, education system in total. And uh, at the same time, we should encourage teach for Malaysia, teach for need, teach for the needs. There are two teach organization there. One is Teach for Malaysia, the other one is Teach for the Need. And there are a few other initiatives on the ground, private initiatives, some supported by GLC, some are seriously, uh, are genuinely on their own, like, I think, uh, uh, let me see, I think Kazana is sponsoring, uh, they call it charter schools, they have a few on the ground. So there are some experiments. I think we should encourage this kind of experiments, you know. And, uh, and, and perhaps uh, this is the new way of looking forward to better education uh, for the country. Yeah. Um, I, th I think we can take one last round, if yep. that doesn't mind. Uh, Adrian? Uh, Dato, <coughs> my question is on one Barisan National, of which you are very supportive. But, uh, Looking at Asian countries and uh, various countries in the world, generally speaking, uh, the majority will never allow this in the sense that, I mean, it's realistic. So do you think that AMNO is going to support this one Barisan national, whereby, you know, it's something that is uh, very, very enlightening and new in the sense that uh, this is a multiracial uh, party, whereas AMNO has been in existence from the very beginning. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, they will still remain a race-based party. I'm not talking about racial or racist, but race-based party will still carry on. Yeah. Um, may I jump in here and ask a qu one or two questions as well? Uh, first one partly related to what Adrian was saying. Um, Dato, you mentioned that um, Amno, <coughs> Amno and its ally, allies had uh, turned the tide before 1969, um, which is a good point. Um, but I, I think back to 1969 uh, when, well, the NEP of course came into being and that changed the economic system quite thoroughly. Um, the alliance became the BN, so the political structure was also changed very thoroughly and that involved getting the, the opposition into the, the ranks of the alliance, uh, but that also meant that one still followed the race-based formula, that getting Garakan in to, to be the representative of the Chinese and all that. Um, Kuala Lumpur becoming a federal territory. Uh, but all that was, it was of course, very com uh, comprehensive, and it was able to be done because the UMNO leadership at that time was very decisive, very strong. Mm -hmm. Of course, there was the China factor that, that also helped the Chinese support for Abdul Razak. Um, this time around, um, well, they, of course, the situation is still is quite different. We had, of course, the ETP, the GTP could be seen as two ways of trying to change the econo economics and the political structure. Then we come to the, the decisive leadership itself. Um, I, I would venture that uh, why Najib's reforms over the last four years had not had a greater impact on winning back votes was because of certain <laughs> indecisions a certain show of not being decisive enough. Uh, so going forward, I wonder if you see with the new, that now that he has a mandate, will we see a stronger leadership, stronger focus in, in the reforms that he will carry out? Uh, my second question, uh, sorry for being so long-winded. My second question is on Sabah and Sarawak with, with the, the increased role that they now have within the government as well and, and all, all else. Um, there is a certain change in the racial makeup of what they see as Malaysia. No? Uh, the, 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 uh, the ethnic groups on East Malaysia have usually been seen as being not as important, but now we are forced to realize that they are also uh, racial groups in their own sense. And that, that I think for West Malaysians, it's more of a problem, right? Like in, in West Malaysia, there's only been three races plus others, that's it. But uh, now we have to realize that Malaysia is much more than that. And I think this realization that Malaysia is much more complex than, than it, it uh, than had been taught would quite change the mindset of, of a lot of people. Uh, I would like your comment on that. Um, okay. Yeah. And any other last questions from the floor? One last one, Miss. Hello. 
Hi, Dr. Uh, just, a, just two days ago, since uh, the Center of Strategic Engagement had a presentation here, and they said uh, for the Malays across all age groups, uh, they seem to uh, show the preference for an UMNO and PASS merger. So to you, is this even a thinkable scenario? Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, you see, when people ask me, uh, are we not going to cl close down race-based political parties? I say two things. Number one, we are in a democratic system. We don't close down parties <laughs> unless they do something really wrong, like, you know, a desacralization. <laughs> Number two, Psychologically, it's primordial for people to flock together. Yeah, you, you, you know, you have our golfers friend, basketball friends. Uh, uh, I, I mentioned basketball because now I know Hits is playing against uh, San Antonio Spurs. Uh, I'm a supporter of Hits. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I don't think... Um, Within one or two years, AMNO will, will support the idea of uh, 1BN for various reasons. Number one, as I said earlier on, because AMNO feel that we, we are doing well. Uh, why should we dissolve our party? But the other argument is, if we are seeing that down the road there is no other way but becoming a one party isn't it good that when amno is strong you can dictate what the one party will look like for amno it would be in its best interest that when you are strong like now you can have some say or a lot of say in formulating the one bn uh, so, I mean, that's, that's how, how, you know, but uh, coming back to the reality, the reality is I don't think so, BN uh, will support it. And because of that, uh, I think it is for practical reason uh, that direct membership to BN is the way out or the alternative. Whether in the long run, the direct membership channel become a multiracial, a real multiracial party within BN. Now that is another story altogether. Yeah. Uh, wow, well, the chairman, when chairman have question, then the speaker have problems. <laughs> but luckily, no one is pulling away the microphone from me. Okay. Like it happened in some places. Uh, <laughs> okay, two things happened. Uh, I agree with you, sir. Uh, Post-1969, there was a new structure. Uh, Perikatan invite uh, PAS, remember, at that time, and Gerakan. And uh, Tun Raza formed Barisan National. So, and you include uh, parties from Sabah and Sarawak too. Yeah, but uh, the main feature from Peninsular Malaysia was actually Gerakan and PAS. Gerakan remain, the Sabah and Sarawak remain. Of course, Sabah Sarawak, there's always their own story. Sometimes people go in, sometimes people go out. There was a time when we have, we didn't be an opposition, remember? Uh, in Sabah, there was a time when, we didn't be an, there was also opposition in the government. So it's very interesting, yeah. Uh, the other thing was the NEP, yes, New Economic Policy, was monumental, I think, in bringing back support to BN uh, in the next election, which was 1974. What about post-2013? First, there is this new talk about, again, a new structure in BN, uh, the idea of the 1BN uh, direct membership. And if I may jump to the last question about AMNO and PAS merger. You see, if you ask me, I would love 
why only pass and I'm um, no why not PKR also <laughs> I mean uh, candidly speaking yeah but that would be good for BN but would that be good for the country you know why you have AMNO, you have PAS. Already now BN has a perception problem that this is a Malay party. Because MCA and our counterparts didn't do well. So bringing PAS to BN is very good for BN. But I'm also a Malaysian. Is it good for Malaysia to have a BN becoming more Malay? So that is my question. I don't have an answer. Uh, remember I was saying perhaps we need to relaunch new economic model because the new economic model was launched prior to GE13 so there were lots of cynicism and skeptics outside you know it's a good I mean I, I would really say this is a very good uh, program a good a good one yeah there are two things yeah NEM and the ETP yeah so we have to look at both together and I think if you were to combine a new economic model and the economic transformation program, they are, they are, these are good stuff. Of course, there are weaknesses here and there we can, we can now that they're already one or two years uh, uh, in, in its implementation, we can see where, where we go wrong already. Yeah? So we can, we can realign. But I would, I mean, uh, this is something that I plan to, to speak in the next AMNO uh, Supreme Council, that we need really to relaunch the, the NEM. There's a lot of good stuff in it, yeah. Uh, now that, as I said, GE is over, let's move on. I think it's about time that we focus on the lot of inclusive development uh, principles in NEM. We really have to look at it. Uh, for for the way forward, includes doing more transformation. Uh, I know there has always been this question that. You know, PM Najib sometimes seems uh, undecisive, but I don't know whether this is real or this is perception. I think when he is decisive, he's very, very uh, decisive about things. Uh, uh, I can't reveal exactly what happened, but I think when he, he made his mind on amending the University and University College Act, uh, I, I, I thought that he was damn serious about it. He know that uh, uh, most AMNO uh, people don't really like the idea. It's a not um, it's a non AMNO narrative altogether. Yeah, and whether people realize it or not, this is the first GE where university students actually were very free to participate, you know, as workers and volunteers and campaigners in the GE. Uh, since 1974, <laughs> since since the act was enacted in 75, to be exact, yeah, in 75, to be exact. So, so I'm I'm happy for that. Yeah, at least we managed to to get it before uh, GE 13. So, no more jawatan kuasa pemantauan going around with cameras, you know, taking photo. Ha, you student, you am blah blah blah. Nah, tada, this time free. Uh, but it is a teamwork. Yeah. You see, when you do transformation, part of the transformation is political, and part of political transformation is to accept and to realize that politics have changed. Uh, for instance, uh, the other stakeholders want to be part of the decision-making structure and process. To be fair, you can't blame Najib for some of the hiccups that went about after he has announced some of the new policies. Yeah? i give an example. I think the Peace Assembly Act 2012 could have been better if only there were more negotiation between the AG and Lim Chi Wee the then Bar Council President. There was one meeting between two of them. I wish there were more meetings. 
If there were more meetings between the AG and Chiwi, Bar Council President, probably PA 2012 could have been better. I mean, as, as a bill. Yeah. And maybe Bar Council didn't have to walk to Parliament. And even if Chiwi and the Bar Council didn't, didn't like everything that they saw, they probably only do a press conference and send Chiwi and the gang in small group, you know, to, as a delegation to see Nazri as the Minister of Law, de facto Minister of Law. But they, they, choose, they chose to walk uh, because they were not happy at all with uh, the Peace Assembly Act. So, and then uh, in one of the budget speeches, uh, I think in 2011, Najib announced there will be a new scheme for the government servant, a rise in the salary scheme and things of that sort. There was this announcement and it was very well received by the government servant. Suddenly when it was really announced, it came upside down and Najib had to put a stop, call a pause, say, no, stop it first, don't implement it, three months, and then go to the negotiate, uh, negotiate, go to the table and negotiate. So QPEX came in and everybody came in. So lots of meetings and then uh, launch it again and people are happy. So you don't expect the Prime Minister to be doing everything uh, on his own. So it's, it's a teamwork. Sabah and Sarawak. This is interesting. Uh, on the one hand, the ethnic makeup is more complex than peninsula. You know, there is one phrase that you should avoid using when you go to Sabah and Sarawak. Dan line line. Because in peninsula it's easy, you know. You see, we in peninsula we are Malays, Chinese, Indian, Sikh, orang asli. You almost cover the whole range already. You go to Sabah and Sarawak, you will say, Iban, Murut, Kadazan, and then because you want to be inclusive, dan lain lain. Ah, so many people will be, will be offended. Seriously. I learned, I learned a bitter lesson by, by using all oh, dan lain lain. And they were saying, please don't repeat that. I said, what? <laughs> what happened? What did I say wrong? I said, no, nah. then they'll say, no, nah. I mean, they are more than just dan lain lain. So it's a very complex. Because it is more complex, so I can understand your question, Dr. E. But interestingly, I thought one Malaysia is more natural for Sabahan and Sarawakians. Kalima Allah is never an issue in Sabah and Sarawak. That's interesting. Our friends, Sabahans and Sarawakians, you know, Christians in Sabah and Sarawak have been using Allah since time immemorial, never an issue. It is only an issue in Peninsula Malaysia. So, yes, it could be more complex, and because of that, they have more political parties, ethnic base, yeah. And then with the breakouts from one to another, yeah. But interestingly, I think they are more inclusive in nature. I would like to put it that way, yeah, to the extent that issues which we don't seem to be able to uh, understand properly in peninsula are uh, understood very well by Sabahan and Sarawakian. Yeah. So, uh, my, yeah, the, I, I hope I have answered most of the question, if not all. Uh, I must uh, confess that I, I mean, I must admit, I, I, I don't think I can uh, answer all. Uh, those are my my views on what happened in GE13. I think we are looking at the future. We want to see uh, the biggest challenge now is Parliament uh, is starting its first session. I think on the 24th of June. We are all looking forward to a Parliament that is going to be more bipartisan. Uh, we hope so. Uh, we are hoping that uh, Parliament will report to itself, meaning to say that I think there are now more and more calls for Parliament to be independent, yeah, on its own, manage its own affairs, have its own budget. Um, 
we uh, yeah the the constituency delineation is first on the agenda definitely but also uh, when you look at the 13th general election maybe for the first time we are seeing the emergence of the third manifesto for real the first two manifestos are the BN and the PR manifesto. Don't ask me who copies who. Yeah. <laughs> because otherwise, next time you will have to decide, okay, both parties announce it on the same time, on the same day. <laughs> Susah lah, like that. <laughs> that was my joke to Rafizi and gang lah. Ah, come on lah, just because you announce it first, you don't say we copy you, because we can always say you copy many of our documents in the past. So no end to the who copy who lah. The third manifesto is the one that comes out from the ballot box. What does it mean when people vote for BN, mm. but popular vote goes to Pakatan Rakyat? I invited UMC Dell to, to do a survey on Temelo. Yeah. And interestingly, um, you have a a, a, a considerable number of people in Temulu who thought candidate was more important than uh, party, but a slight majority say party is more important than can, than, than the candidate. Uh, and and in other analysts, uh, I have found that uh, people are looking at you know a new, not trends but new things lah. You know something that don't really come out before like I think some of our electorates are becoming more candid yeah can you imagine in my campaign this time I bump into people especially the young ones and the well educated they say Dean I like you but I don't like your party sorry I can't vote for you <laughs> yeah I send an SMS blast uh, there are 66,000 uh, voters uh, we have we sent to about 55,000 and uh, about biasalah Malaysians they don't really reply to this kind of thing about 1,400 replied because we blasted three <coughs> times so about 1,004, 1,005 replied uh, some cursing you lah you are infringing into my private space <laughs> that's not to be mm -hmm. unexpected uh, and but you know, I got SMS, which I thought was friendly. Yeah, Dean, I like you. We saw your manifesto, like your poster, blah blah blah. But we don't like your party, lah. You know that kind of thing. No, but but you see, I mean, I take it, I take it as a refreshing thing. What does it mean? Yes, we all know that your vote is secret, but I like the idea that people are open about it. This is important. This is important. People are becoming more candid. You know, so to them, it's nothing personal. Maybe because they know I'm okay, I'm candid because because of that they say. It. But I hear this also from some other candidates. You know that people are becoming more candid. Yeah. You know, it's like, hey, you are a good friend lah. You're my neighbor lah. Blah blah blah. We go to the same school lah, but you're in the wrong party lah. You know, so I can't vote for you this time. I thought, yeah, because what we need for Malaysian politics is less of the kitchen cabinet stuff less of negotiation that you don't know what we need is more transparency that not that every Malaysians want to know everything that is to be decided but more and more Malaysians want to be part of the process in some way or the other and I think we should I call this a new kind of conversation, a new conversation. We should mm. encourage this new conversation. We should widen the public sphere. I'm borrowing from Jürgen uh, Habermas, yeah? the public sphere. And we should really put an end to whatever <laughs> culture of fear mm. that is probably still prevailing. So we need, we need this kind of new political discourse where people will voice up, uh, people will listen and it is from this kind of discourses and this kind of conversation that Malaysia will be a better nation. So thank you all.
I am honored to be here. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Saifuddin, for, and we will definitely continue the conversation and thank you for your candidness. I, th I think everyone here will uh, appreciate that. And good luck in your, in your campaign, <laughs> your coming campaign. Um, and we hope to welcome you back again very shortly. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.